now we are going to discuss robotic laparoscopy and bariatric surgery first of all we are going to discuss the laparoscopy so tell me what is the name of needle used to create pneumoperitoneum and the name of needle it is virus needle name of needle used to create pneumoperitoneum and this is virus needle this is virus needle you can see here how this virus needle looks like so it is having you can see this is the virus needle so it is having sharp tipped needle and there is blunt tipped obturator this blunt tipped obturator it is going to decrease the risk of bowel injury so whenever we are using the virus needle for creating pneumoperitoneum this is known as closed method and if we are using this hassan cannula if we are using this Hassan cannula, that is known as open method. So there are two methods of creating pneumoperitoneum. One is closed method and the second is open method. So we discussed in closed method, we use virus needle. And you saw this, that virus needle is having this blunt tipped obturator. So there is a safety valve at the tip. And because of this safety valve at the tip, it is associated with low risk of bowel injury. Okay. In open method, we are using this Hassan cannula. So here, the pneumoperitoneum, it is created under direct vision. Since it is created or performed under direct vision, it is associated with low risk of vessel injury. So there is low risk of vessel injury in open method. There is low risk of bowel injury in closed method. In closed method, we use virus needle and in open method, we use Hassan cannula. Next, what is the site of insertion of trocar? So it is at or just below umbilicus. Site of insertion of trocar, it is at or just below umbilicus. So whenever you are going to insert the trocar, how many layers are penetrated? So here you can see the layers penetrated by trocar. So outermost skin, we are going to penetrate the skin. After that, superficial fascia, then deep fascia, then fascia transversalis and here you can see this is parietal peritoneum. So which layers are penetrated by tocar? It is skin, superficial fascia, deep fascia, fascia transversalis and parietal peritoneum. Now see the important questions related to laparoscopy. First, you have seen in the OTs that what is the most commonly or most preferred gas for laparoscopy. So which gas we use in OT for lap? Coli, laparoscopic cholecystectomy or lap surgeries, obviously we use carbon dioxide. So it is CO2, carbon dioxide. How much should be the flow of CO2 in creating pneumoperitoneum? It is 1 liter per minute. Flow of carbon dioxide, how much? It is 1 liter per minute. And how much intra-abdominal pressure should be maintained? So the intra-abdominal pressure during laparoscopy, it should be maintained between 12 to 15 mmHg. Intra-abdominal pressure should be maintained between 12 to 15 mmHg. So see the complications of laparoscopy. During laparoscopy, since we use CO2, what happens sometimes there is CO2 retention. And because of CO2 retention, it causes irritation of diaphragm. CO2 retention causes irritation of diaphragm and because of this irritation of diaphragm, what's the problem? There is referred pain to the shoulder via phrenic nerve. So what happens? There is referred pain. Referred pain to shoulder via phrenic nerve. Via phrenic nerve. So first complication that after laparoscopic surgeries, there can be shoulder pain. If you remember Keher sign in splenic trauma, what happens in Keher sign? In splenic trauma, there is collection of blood. So what happens? This blood is going to irritate the diaphragm. And because of irritation of diaphragm, in that case also, there is referred pain to left shoulder via phrenic nerve. So in Keher sign also, there is left shoulder pain. And here in laparoscopy also, there is shoulder pain. Why? Because of CO2 retention. Second complication, it is gas embolism. What happens? During induction of pneumoperitoneum, sometimes there is insufflation of gas directly into an open vein. So what happens? If there is insufflation of gas, insufflation of gas directly into open vein, it can lead to 
gas embolism. Third complication, CO2 embolism. So whenever patient is having CO2 embolism, what happens? Initially, there is rise in ETCO2, end tidal CO2, it is going to rise. Why end tidal CO2 is going to rise? Because of pulmonary excretion of absorbed CO2. Why? Because of pulmonary excretion of absorbed CO2. It is because of pulmonary excretion of absorbed CO2. Second, but what happens? There is sudden decrease afterwards. Why? Because of fall in cardiac output. So, after that, there is sudden decrease because of decreased cardiac output or fall in cardiac output. So, three important complications. One is shoulder pain. Second is gas embolism because of insufflation of gas directly into an open vein and third is CO2 embolism. The hint about CO2 embolism in the question will be this that there will be initial rise of end tidal CO2. So, now see the important points related to gases used in pneumoperitoneum. The first pneumoperitoneum was created by filtered room air. But what is the big problem with filtered room air? If you are using filtered room air, there is increased risk of gas embolism. So, first pneumoperitoneum, it was created by filtered room air. Filtered room air. What is the big problem with this filtered room air? That this is going to increase the risk of gas symbolism. So, there is increased risk of gas symbolism. So, what are the gases we use for creating pneumoperitoneum? Usually, most preferred it is carbon dioxide followed by nitrous oxide. The most preferred carbon dioxide followed by nitrous oxide. See the various characteristic features. Carbon dioxide, why it is most preferred? Because it is 200 times more diffusible than air. So, what is the advantage? It is rapidly cleared from body and it is rapidly cleared from lungs also. You know CO2 can be used for long duration surgery. Why? Because it does not support combustion. Now, see the nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is 68 percent as rapidly absorbed in blood as CO2, 68 percent. There is one advantage what? It is having mild analgesic effect. That is why we can use it for short operative procedure. The big problem with nitrous oxide that it supports combustion and if it supports combustion, so what is the problem? In long duration surgery, we are supposed to use the cautery also. Clear? So, since this gas supports combustion, it should not be used for long duration surgery. Since it is having mild analgesic effect, we can use it for short operative procedure. So, overall which one is most preferred? It is carbon dioxide. In most of the surgical field, this is an era of minimal access surgery. So, what are the surgeries which are included in minimal access surgery like laparoscopy, thoracoscopy, endoluminal endoscopy or perivisceral endoscopy even in orthopedics arthroscopy and intra-articular joint surgeries. All these are minimal access surgeries. If we are going to compare minimal access surgeries over open surgeries, there are significant advantages of minimal access surgery. So, if it is possible in most of the cases, we should go for minimal access surgery if there are clear cut and significant advantages. So, in general, see what are the advantages of minimal access surgery. You know, during minimal access surgery, the size of wound, it is small. And if there is lesser wound size, so what will happen? There is lesser wound trauma. Because of lesser wound trauma, there is lesser wound pain. And obviously, there is decreased risk of herniation. Why? Because the size of wound is small. So, first, in minimal access surgery, there is small wound size. So, decreased wound trauma, decreased wound pain. There is decreased wound infection, decreased risk of dehiscence, decreased bleeding. Since the size of wound is small, there is decreased risk of herniation and nerve entrapment. In minimal access surgery, most of the body parts are covered. What happens? We have only a small incision site via which we are inserting the instruments. So, here what happens? There is decreased heat loss. There is improved vision. Why? Because of magnification and lighting. 
so because of magnification and lighting there is improved vision there is improved mobility after the surgery because there is lesser pain so what happens here in minimal access surgery there is faster recovery and shorter hospital stay so because of faster recovery and shorter hospital stay there is early return to work there is early return to work clear these are the advantages of minimal access surgery there are certain important definitions which are asked nowadays one is day care surgery second is overnight stay surgery third is short stay surgery so day care surgery also known as day means it should be done in that particular day only same day surgery means in this patient there should be same day discharge in day care surgery same day surgery means in this patient there should be same day discharge day only surgery also known as ambulatory surgery so what are the characteristic features first here that in day care surgery the patient is admitted for 12 hours only and there should be same day discharge so patient is admitted for 12 hours patient is admitted for 12 hours and there is same day discharge same day discharge second is overnight stay surgery so patient is going to stay for one night with early morning discharge so here what is the duration patient is admitted for 23 hours there is night stay with early morning discharge and there is short stay surgery in the short stay surgery patient is admitted for 72 hours so day care surgery admitted for 12 hours overnight stay surgery patient is admitted for 23 hours with early morning discharge and short stay surgery here patient is admitted for 72 hours mm -hmm.